If you haven't done so yet, please pause the video and try to answer the question on your own before listening on. The question notes that there are no external torques acting on our system. So in that case, we know that the initial angular momentum must equal the final angular momentum. Now, we want to recall that angular momentum is equal to the product of a rotational inertia and an angular velocity. We also want to note that there are two objects in this scenario. There is the cockroach as well as the merry-go-round. And it might be helpful to label the merry-go-round as object one. We'll use MGR for merry-go-round. And then the Texas cockroach as object two, which we can just call TC. So with those notations in mind, we can expand the initial angular momentum to include both the merry-go-round as well as the Texas cockroach. So here we have the initial angular momentum for the merry-go-round, and here is that of the Texas cockroach. Now, it's important to note from the graph that initially these objects are spinning at an angular speed of omega b. And the question notes that omega b is equal to 6 radians per second. So we can actually plug 6 in for the initial angular velocity of the merry-go-round as well as that of the cockroach. Now, it's also important to note that the cockroach begins at the center of the circular disk. So imagine a circle. We could put a little dot in the middle to represent the center. And the reason we want to focus our attention on this is because for the Texas cockroach, the rotational inertia is going to equal its mass times the distance from the center squared. This is the expression we use for any general point particle, and we can consider the cockroach to be a point particle. But if the cockroach starts at the center, then its distance to the center would be zero, in fact. So that means that the initial rotational inertia of the Texas cockroach is zero. If we plug zero in for that rotational inertia, that's going to eliminate this term altogether. So we can actually simplify the left-hand side of this equation. We will now head over to the right-hand side of the equation. We are going to have the rotational inertia of the merry-go-round multiplied by its final angular velocity. We can go ahead and look at the graph. The final angular velocity is omega a, which the question notes is 5 radians per second. So we can plug 5 in there. And then we'll add that to the final angular momentum of the Texas cockroach. We don't know its angular momentum, so we'll just call it i2. And then we'll multiply it by the final angular velocity, which again is 5. Now we actually have some like terms here. We have 6i1 on the left side and 5i1 on the right side. So let's subtract the 5i1 over to the left side. Now the question actually wants us to calculate the ratio of the bug's rotational inertia, which is the i2 term, to that of the disk, which again is i1. So we actually have to solve for i2 over i1. Why don't we divide both sides by i1? And then we can divide both sides by 5. And when we do that, we can see that the ratio of the cockroach's rotational inertia to that of the disk is equal to 0.2. And this is the correct answer to the question. Thanks for watching. If you liked the video, please click the thumbs up icon and subscribe so you can stay tuned for other videos. You can send in your own question to the email address on the screen, and I'll do my best to post an answer to it on YouTube.